Good morning. Good morning. I want to welcome you here now to July the 2nd. We're over the middle. We're headed towards the, uh, the end of the year. So uh, we said that the, uh, jokingly said at the congregation meeting uh, last week, uh, is it too early to remind you to get your year-end reports in? <laughs> I know that's an ongoing uh, thing with uh, just to, to remind you. Let's look at our announcements. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet out on the bulletin board for uh, the painting, uh, canvas painting, and things like that that, uh, that Don McManus is heading up. Uh, I guess it's for the ladies or whoever would like to paint a canvas or whatever. I don't, I don't know a whole lot about that. Uh, you would have to talk to either uh, Don McManus or Jamie. But they seem to have the, uh, the information for that. Also, uh, next week we will be celebrating communion. So we will have our deacons and we'll have the elements ready. And for those of you who are listening at home, uh, gives you a, a chance to be able to uh, uh, gather up the elements for that time next week. Now, it doesn't have to be uh, wine or anything like that, or grape juice. It, it's, uh, it's not so much the, the element, but the meaning behind it those elements. So you've had time for preparation for that. Also, uh, there's uh, tracks available. Uh, we have them uh, at different locations. I would encourage you to visit the, 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 the track tables and be able to hand those things out wherever it is you go. Because it's like planting seeds. Uh, you put it somewhere or you give it to someone that may make a difference in their life. We have the tracks here and also on the back window on there on this windowsill and also over in the Sunday school. Tracks are an easy way to open the door to be able to share the gospel with someone. So they are available. Take them and also share them. Uh, we're also collecting water and Gatorade for the uh, local fire departments and the EMS folks. Now's the time to bring them in. Uh, as soon as they come in, we will deliver them because now is the time that they need them when it's so hot. And then again, uh, on July the 12th uh, at 6.30, we'll be uh, visiting com Country Comfort uh, with Music Ministry. Uh, Jamie will be sharing that along with the others who come up to us support and uh, sing along. Uh, on the 23rd of uh, July, be the uh, deadline to be able to sign up for that canvas painting party. And uh, the information then is available, and that will take place on the end of this month, on the 31st. We also have the ongoing uh, gift cards, uh, Wise's gift card. So if you know someone that needs one or you'd like to purchase some, Names in the in the bulletin there. You can see Vaughn, Mary Sue, or Mary Fun. I know a lot of our folks are out uh, vacationing or taking advantage of the uh, of the holiday, Independence Day, that's up and coming. So we need to remember all of those folks who are absent from our congregation this morning, and also to remember them in prayer uh, as they travel. Not only for those that we know and love, but for all those who are out also in the highways and byways throughout our nation and throughout the world. Do we have any other announcements? Seeing none, uh, then let's turn our attention to the uh, opening up of our service. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Father, we come to you this morning. And Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be in your house and be with your people. And Lord, we would just ask it to every heart that is here in the presence of the, and also those who are joining us via the media system, that our hearts would be receptive, open to your will, open to the moving and the direction of your Holy Spirit. Be with us, Lord, as we come together and celebrate and rejoice in the love that you share with each and every one of us on Calvary's cross. Lord, we thank you and we look forward
Lord, to be a part of your ministry. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stand, if you will, as we sing the doxology. <laughs> Do we have any 
having children? Sing so loud so the Lord hears us. All right? Are you, if you're happy and you know it, say, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, and your face is going to show. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, stomp your feet. If you're happy and you know it, stomp your feet. If you're happy and you know it, and your eyes will surely show it. If you're happy and you know it, stomp your feet. If you're happy and you know it, say amen. Amen. If you're happy and you know it, say amen. Amen. If you're happy and you know it, and your eyes will surely show it. If you're happy and you know it, say amen. Amen. If you're happy and you know it, be all three. Amen. If you're happy and you know it, be all three. Amen. If you're happy and you know it, and your face is surely shown. If you're happy and you know it, be all three.
from the truth of God. That's the only answer. No matter how powerful an individual might think they are, stand before a righteous and holy God. Mary Sue, thank you for reading this morning. Today I'm reading from Galatians chapter 5. I'm going to read verse 1 and then 13 through 14. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. For you were called to freedom, brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Thank you. We're looking this morning at freedom and liberty. Now, when the Apostle Paul is writing to the church there in Galatia, sometimes differs from the liberty and freedom that we think about these days. This up and coming week we'll be celebrating Independence Day and you'll hear a lot of words and songs about freedom and about liberty and about independence. But the apostle here is offering to the church of Galatia some encouragement and also some instruction as to where their liberty came from. And how that each of those individuals in the church there at Galatia and how it transpires into this world that we live in today. Some of these same practices as it concerns liberty and freedom. The first word that Paul uses here in chapter 5, verse 1, says stand fast. Stand fast. Be steadfast. In other words, we need to take a stand. We need to not be moving. and We need to not be vacillating from side to side. From one flowing whichever way the wind blows as the doctrine of, of what we believe. We need to be firmly grounded and secure in what we know to be the truth. And that truth is found only in God's word. As we look at the, as, at the world around us and even in third times there was there was opposition there was there was uh, there was individuals that doubted there was out and out, out disbelief you know it seems like things haven't changed from you know around 60 AD until today but Paul is here saying steadfast remain firm he even told us the, the church at Corinth and we say, use this passage of scripture a lot of times at, at graveside uh, services. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 says this, But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain, in the Lord. In other words, don't be discouraged. We have victory. We need to remain steadfast, immovable in our walk with the Lord. Steadfast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. That particular passage, that, that, this, that one verse has a lot to say. Just those first couple of words. Remain steadfast, immovable, in the liberty wherewith, wherewith Christ has made us free. What the Apostle Paul is telling the church there in Galatia and is also telling us that our freedom and our liberties are from God. We hear about the cost of freedom for our, you know, of, of 
across the world and globes with individuals who are engaged in armed conflict that say that freedom is never free because someone had to sacrifice for the cause, if you will, I'm going to put it in that terminology. The freedoms and the liberties that you and I enjoy is because Christ died on the cross. Those are liberties. The word liberty means we have the opportunity. We're unrestrained, uninhibited. And we can come and go as we desire. At least that's what some folks think about liberty here in our world. But in the scriptural realm, we have liberty to come and go. We're uninhibited. In other words, we have the opportunity. We can choose whether we wish to worship God or not. But once we've understood the freedom that God has given us, the, the, the freedom of not being accused of sins because our sins have been forgiven, paid for by Jesus Christ, why would we not want to worship and serve God? The price was paid. And the liberty that we enjoy, that being able to share in our own personal belief, that liberty and that freedom is something that no one can take away from you. No one. Your liberty and your freedom in Christ has been paid for by your acceptance of Jesus Christ as Savior. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, you and I fit into that whosoever category. And even the rascals that we don't know and like. Christ died for them too. Because Christ has set us free. He told that bunch of disciples back there in John in 832, he says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. When we know the truth of Jesus Christ, when we know the truth that God sent his son to earth to perish and die on a cruel cross for you and I, to reestablish that communion between us and God, it cost Jesus his life. sometimes we can with God. We have this unfettered knowledge that you and I can never be removed from that as long as we believe with all of our heart and everything that the Lord gives us we take by faith. We accepted the cross by faith. We accepted Jesus by faith. And we have the faith and the freedom and the to be able to express, I mean, what the Lord has done in our lives. Look what the Lord has done. Because he made changes in our, the way that we thought. He made a way, we, we sang that song not too long ago. You know, you can be totally dirt poor living in a mud hut and still have the freedom and liberty to know that Jesus Christ is your Savior. And it doesn't get any more wealthier than that. And people look at you sort of strange, but you know, I don't know, maybe they, they look at me strange anyhow. But you know, I get to talk with somebody, I say, you know, I'm in line for, you know, an, an inheritance that's out of this world. You know, my father owns it all. Of course, they look at you, of course, it's kind of strange, and I say, Heavenly Father. It's all his. And I've been adopted into the family. I'm in line for an inheritance that's out of this world. So are you if you've accepted Jesus Christ. You see, that's freedom. That's liberty. That ability to be able to choose whether we want to do something or not do something. Because of that Christ consciousness, knowing that God loved us so much and wants us to fellowship with Him 
And the more that we study, the more that we learn about him, the more that, you know, we be it. When we look at something, we recognize, well, that's not right. And that's something we should stay away from. Well, I don't want to go that way. Oh, I'm not the only one that can say that. But we have a Christ-centered consciousness. And Paul then goes on to say that that we shall not be entangled in the yoke of bondage. Don't fall prey to it again. Now Paul is here speaking about the law. You know, don't the law can't save you. Well, I'm speaking the old the Levitical law. That can't save it. it. The 613 laws, it never saw it saved anybody. It just made you wonder, well, did I break one today? A freedom of knowing that we don't have to keep all of them, all of those 613 laws were under the fear of breaking one that would, that would do us all, exempt us from going to heaven. We have the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ that allows us to function on a daily basis knowing that I don't have to do this. I can't pluck a hair on the Sabbath or I can't pull a chair out. That might be considered plowing. You know, all those, or I can't push an elevator button or turn on a light switch. All those things that we don't have to worry about. Because Christ set us free from that. And if we have any doubts about, you know, what it, our walk with the Lord should be, you know, the book of James is a good place to start. I encourage you to read that. It gives a brief, detailed uh, list of, not a list, but encouragement of how we should be walking and sharing the Lord. Paul also says, you know, don't, don't fall back into that. Don't get drawn back into legalism and traditions. I was with an individual just yesterday, not yesterday, it's Friday, that uh, they were, he was complaining or said about a church split. And I said, was, was the church split biblical or traditional? Because of traditions. They said it was traditions. So that's terrible that, you know, folks will put aside the gospel and lean on something that's not the gospel. But then Paul then says, brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Not only use not the liberty for the occasion to the flesh. In other words, Paul is saying here, yeah, we've been called, we've been given that freedom to be able to not be under the law, but let's not use our liberty as an excuse to continue in, in a lifestyle or in a, in a sinful activity. The grace of God is not a license to sin. We should have our Christ consciousness to know that whatever that incident is is not right should draw us away from instead of into. And then Paul says also that for all the law is fulfilled in one word. Even this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus told his disciples just prior to the cross, a new commandment I give you. It's not one like the old, but you should love one another as I have loved you. Loving one another is a reflection of the love that Jesus has in our hearts for, other, for us, and we reflect it back to others. Now let me tell you what, there is some rascals out there that it is just hard to love. <coughs> you know. You've known them too long. You've seen too many activities, and you know that you know they're just they're not unlovable, but they're hard to love. Doesn't mean you're and that individual, you know, needs to accept the Lord if they have not. Some of them are family members, some of them are friends. You know, we need 
to love them, but not endorse some activities. You see, the influence that you and I have in our lives reflects to others. Because we have that liberty and that freedom that Christ has given, that joy that Christ has given us to be able to share and to make a difference in the world. Make a difference in the lives of the people that we encounter. You know, the result of these liberties and this freedom, this freedom and liberties and found that is found only in Jesus Christ. You know, it was resulted in the birth of a nation. Now I'm going to ask you to reflect back to ninth grade American history. Can you go back that far? <laughs> ninth grade American history. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to ask you the years and the dates for Cortez or Ponce de Leon or anything like that here. That I'm not going to ask you. I never could really figure out why we needed to know the dates anyway. I guess for the test. It was on the test. You see, it was God consciousness, Christ consciousness, in a group of individuals that saw things that where they lived and they wanted to go and strike out and make a new world. These are the words of a fellow by the name of, maybe if you remember, William Bradford. He was from the Plymouth and plantation. He wrote this. He's, of course, speaking of the pilgrims who came here. Unlike some folks who, these history revisionists that say that they came here to you know, enslave people. No. That's not the truth. This is what William Bradford wrote. They shook off the yoke of anti-Christian bondage. And as the Lord's free people joined themselves by covenant to the Lord into a church of state in the fellowship of the gospel to walk in all his ways made known or to be made known unto them according to their best endeavors whatsoever it should cost them the Lord assisting them. Written by a man, Bradford, in 1620 something. That's the reason they came. That's the reason they left the yoke of anti-Christian bondage. They knew what it was like to live in a, in a, a country where you had a national religion. They joined themselves by covenant with God. That same covenant that God made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That same covenant that God made with you and I. His covenants don't ever go away. They're not broken. They remain intact and will forever remain intact. These individuals that came to our shores in Plymouth, It was like a, like a ripple effect. Did you ever throw a big goonie into a pond? You, when you see those concentric rings, you know, the waves aren't as big as the farther out it goes. You know, but even if it gets to the shore, it might upset a delicate ecosystem right there along the, the shoreline. These individuals that came and started to this new world, and because of their faith, because of their reflection of their faith, because of their freedom and liberty, knowing that their freedom and liberty came from God, to be able to choose to serve Him or not to serve Him. Their choice was to serve Him. Started a, a community. And because of their influence, this ripple effect, Influence molded and shaped the 
framers of the Declaration of Independence. Their God consciousness of knowing what's right and wrong, the difference between good and evil, the difference between knowing what it's like to live under a tyrannical government, anti-Christian, Mr. Bradford calls it. Anti-Christian bondage. These are the same individuals that wrote the Declaration of Independence who realized in their own hearts that the author of freedom and liberty came from God. It came from God. You know, even in the earlier times prior to and including with Rome, you know, how many of you remember the Greek philosophers about Aristotle and Plato? You know, those two individuals, they thought that the state or the government should be the primary institution that was more important to be able to <coughs> control the, the destiny of the citizenry. In a sense, along with all the other, other paganistic gods that they worship, they made God their God. There's folks that still remember that. They still think that. That government is God. It's sad that they don't remember what the, what the Lord wrote in Genesis chapter 1. Then God said, let us make man in our image. According to our life. inspiration and the reflection and the likeness of God. And you know what's even worse? When a man thinks that he's God, or when man thinks that he's God. Many, many years ago, I walked into a hospital bed to visit someone who had, had been involved in an accident. While I was there, the doctor came in. He walked through the door, looked over at the, the individual, the patient laying on the bed. He said, I'm the man that saved your life. Well, that's a pretty heavy thought. You know, well, maybe with his skills and abilities, maybe, but he didn't save his life. God put him back together. God created him. God saved you. You know, it's bad that, you know, people think that they're so far above any rules and regulations that there's no accountability for them. I mean, that, that's what my Bible says. There's coming a time when individuals who think that way, they'll be in Revelation 20, 21, excuse me, Revelation uh, I think it's 21, 21 to 19. That, uh, excuse me, 20 and 11, Revelation 20 and 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, the Lord Jesus. Those individuals who think that they are God will stand before the righteous, holy God, Jesus. There'll be no slick lawyers, there'll be no plea bargaining, there'll be no Oh, I didn't know. Jesus being the righteous judge that he is. You see, governments don't make God. People do. And people with their evil tendencies and their own agendas and their own narratives and things of that nature. You know, they affect those people outside of their own. And it's nothing new. Nothing new at all. Solomon wrote this. 
in Proverbs 29 and 2. It says this, when the righteous are in, a, in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. So those things that were happening, that's happening is nothing new. When the righteous are in charge and authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked are, we're left holding the stick, the derby stick. One might ask, is there any hope for all of this? Can we make a difference in the lives of people? I don't know what sphere of influence you live in, but you can make a difference in the lives of your friends, relatives, and loved ones. Maybe not today, but maybe down the road. I'll read you as we close. I'll read this, this very enlightening passage. It said, uh, and this took place some 80 years after the pilgrims arrived. A fellow by the name of Jonathan Edwards was born in 1703. He was a son of a, of a minister. He was known in throughout Baptist history as a revivalist. He was the only boy in of 11 children. Now, can you imagine that? Having 10 sisters. <laughs> Maybe he had a room off for himself, you know, <laughs> out, out in the back end of the, the, of the lot. He was the only boy of 11. In 1927, he married Sarah Pierpoint. Pierpoint. They themselves had 11 children, which continued a generational blessing that populated America with godly offspring for centuries. Now here's some of the things that Jonathan Edwards did. He believed in rising before the sun for prayer. He would then read a chapter of the Bible to his children before the day began. Though, though perhaps the greatest intellect produced in colonial America. Each day he took time out of his, from his writing, pastoring, and mission work with the natives to give one hour of undivided attention to his children. During this time, he would go over their lessons or answer any questions they might have. Jonathan and Sarah shared the priority of training up their prodigy for service to God and to man. 170 years after their marriage, a study was done of some 1,400 of their descendants, revealing some amazing facts. In 1900, this single marriage produced 13 college presidents, 65 profession, professors, 100 lawyers, a dean of an of a, uh, outstanding law school, 30 judges, 56 physicians, the dean of a medical school, 80 holders of public office, three United States senators, three mayors, of large cities, three state governors, and one controller of the United States Treasury, and one vice president of the United States. Members of the family have written 135 books, edited 18 journals and periodicals. They entered into the ministry in droves, with nearly 100 of them of them becoming missionaries overseas. What can one person accomplish 
What is the value of a single human life? The story of the Edwards family illustrates the power of the covenant with God. The God who covenanted with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob also covenants with individuals and empowers them to change the world. Change the world in his name. God gives purpose to every individual life. We have a role to play in this ever-changing task. You know, the things that are unfolding here in the United States, we see all kinds of things. Folks might ask me you know, where we're headed to. We're headed down the wrong direction. But you know, the further that green gets away from that initial inflow, in, impact, the further we get away from our grounding, from our, from our root, the root of David, the impact that was given and made at Calvary, the further we get away from Jesus Christ, the more things that will unfold before our very eyes. I said this before, but it bears out saying it again. Any nation, any civilization or nation that rejects the gospel of Jesus Christ accelerates immorality, perversions, and the destruction of the most innocent children. We live in a world where constant exposure reduces resistance. Bombarded in every aspect and area of our lives. And it has an adverse effect on our lives. First of all, we tolerate it. Then we accept it. Then we admire it. And then we conform to it. Do we need the Lord in our nation? True independence comes from the Lord, not from any individual, except Jesus Christ. That is the answer. The answer that makes an influence to those who come behind us, should the Lord tarry. We sang a song many years ago, may those who come behind us find us faithful. But until that time, folks, we have a commandment that has never been rescinded, and that is to go out, preach, teach, and make disciples. Make a difference. Change a life. Not for our cause. For his. America is still the greatest land in this world. Yeah, it has its problems. Let's pray for revival, and let's be a part of it. Join us now as we stand and say, 799, America with you. And she is, she's big and broad. From sea to shining sea. <laughs>
just ask that you would be with us as we dismiss to the world that's beyond these four walls. Give us the strength and courage and the inspiration to be able to share your love. And Lord, we would just ask that you would be and grant total independence, free from sin, for those individuals that we come in contact with those that we know and love. Lord, mend our every fall. Be with us. And Lord, may we see you moving and shaking and progressing towards the call that you have on each of our lives. Be with us as we celebrate Independence Day and know that you and freedom two words that are synonymous with one another. You gave us the freedom from the penalty of sin for that which we will be forever grateful. Keep us safe until we come into your presence. In Jesus' mighty and matchless name I pray. Amen. <laughs>